Welcome to MMA Fancast. My name is Luke Payson, and I am honored to have Cody Matthews back on the show. Cody, welcome back. Thanks for having me, Luke. I am thrilled to have you back on the show. A huge congratulations to you. You were on the show one time before uh, talking about your big um, pro MMA fight versus Victor Lapari for Brawlenberg 16, which happened a few days ago on April uh, 15th. And you called it right here on MMA FanCast. Uh, you predicted winning. You predicted taking sort of his um, 3-0 record, obviously, and some of the publicity and hype behind him. But I'm going to let you talk about it because you had an incredible knockout, stiffened him up uh, with one punch. Um, it, it was it was obviously very uh, impressive, to say the least. And he had hundreds of people there. Um, and you actually said something nice about his fans that had come out to support him. So we have a lot to cover. Let's let's first just talk about what was it like? We're going to kind of go backwards. We'll start with the end. What was it like to get such a big win? And then I'll break it down round by round because you did have two different rounds and a lot to talk about. Yeah, no, I mean, anytime you can go in there and get a finish, that's kind of the objective. Um, you want to go in there, have a dominant performance, hopefully take no damage, get a knockout or submission, you know, go home unscathed. Um, you know, anytime you can get a finish, it's kind of a dominant victory. That's the main goal. Um, yes, yeah, so it, it felt great to, you know, kind of come back from a first round with a little bit of adversity and then come back in the second round and be able to end the show there. Sure. And you were coming off uh, a big head kick knockout. Um, and I was saying on the commentary that I, I would assume, so now I get to ask you directly, I would assume that after your first round and what we'll, we'll discuss kind of you know, it was a bit of a uh, little bit of adversity for you. Obviously, not every round is going to go right. How much did that knockout, the head kick knockout, the fight before, give you the confidence to basically just keep being aggressive, keep throwing? Because it looked like if you were timid, if you were hesitant in the second round, you would have obviously never landed that big knockout punch. But you, but you stayed aggressive even though the first round hadn't gone your way. So. Was that going on between round one and two in your mind? Or is that kind of your style to always be aggressive? Um, actually, the first round, we the objective was to go a little lighter because he's a very aggressive fighter. He uh, he overwhelms guys. He's very aggressive with his wrestling. If you're not another wrestler that's used to that type of pace, he's going to break you. And that's uh, it's a good tactic. He goes in there, he breaks guys, and they just can't handle what he's throwing at them. Um, so we saw that we saw that he starts to taper off, you know, into the later rounds and said, all right. I was like, you know, first round, he came out even faster than expected, came out some good strike and hit me with a good flurry right off the bat. Then from there, I kind of mitigated range with my jab a bit more. We go back and forth on the feet. He uh, he caught a kick of mine and he, you know, I stopped one or two of his shots in the first. This one, he grabbed the leg and he stepped right in between uh, and pushed it down. So really nice takedown that I like doing myself. There's no time to defend on that. Um, after about 20 seconds on the ground or so, I was he got my head up against the cage. I was like, well, I was like, it's going to be risky for me to get up here. I was like, the goal of the first round obviously isn't to lose, but a big thing was wearing him down. I was like, I'm in the safe position here. I'm defending, um, you know. From certain angles, you might not be able to tell, but a lot of his punches were kind of just missing me or not really hitting with a lot of damage. So at some point I said, I'm not winning this round. I'm going to use this position here where I'm safe to wear him out. I don't want him just to sit here and lay on me, which he it's not his style. He wants to push and push. So, you know, I was getting my shins in the arms. I was playing like spider guard at one point a little bit, trying to put my foot up in his bicep. And, you know, I was right there in my corner. My my coaches were literally two feet from me. So they're able to guide me through. And then, uh, yeah, once uh, once the bell went off, I stood up and my stool was right there for me. Coach said, hey, you know, he's he's he wasn't exhausted by any means. But after an aggressive first round, you're not as fresh as you should be necessarily. You're not as fresh as you were going in, let's say. You know, and I had – I preserved my energy well. I wasn't tired. And then I knew second and coming into the third round that we were going to have to, you know, it was time to push the pace on him now. And, you know, we didn't really have to that much. 20 seconds in, he came out just as aggressive as he did the first. 
had me um, tried to push me up against the cage and we broke off a clinch. No, we didn't break off a clinch. He threw a jab. I slipped it and threw a, a short little right hand that caught him. He tried to push into me again, clipped with another right hand. And as he tried to like actually force me against the cage, I took an angle to my right and was able to fully extend with a right hand that kind of whipped his head. Um, from there, I saw I had him. I had him a little hurt. I could see it in his eyes, so I started really picking the pressure up. Hit him with, I think, a left hook, and he shot on my single. I caught him under the arm, so he wasn't able to get in too tight. Started hammer fisting him, and I actually thought I was going to put him out while he was on my leg. He let go, hit him with a little left hook, um, and then, again, had him hurt even more. And as he tried to circle out, I hit him with that left, mm -hmm. uh, the last left hook that he was circling into. So, you know, he was already hurt and he came into it full power and then, it, you know, he was out from there. So, yeah, first first round didn't go my way. I don't like getting taken down. I absolutely hate getting taken down. Um, I pride myself a lot on my defensive wrestling. So still a little upset about that, but I had to be smart um, and, you know, use use the situation to my advantage. So I was able to I was able to do just that. You know, the game plan worked out at the end of the day it was, hey use this position to stay safe, wear him out. These next two rounds, we're going to put on the pressure on him because he's going to have not near as much gas as I'm going to have. So, yeah, it was – in a way, it was part of the game plan. The game plan wasn't to get taken down. The game plan wasn't to lose the first round. But the game plan did play out to wear him out a little bit. And like I said, I don't think he was completely exhausted by any means after a round, but I definitely had more energy and oomph to me afterwards. Oh, sure. I appreciate the very specific breakdown you gave there because that last, that last few exchanges and you, it was, it was a lot, you know, you hit him, there was a flurry. He got in on you, you pulled him back up the, the, the hammer fist. I mean, you really broke that down all very well. The, the, the image that the people that are going to remember is that last clean left hook where he felt like kind of that dramatic fall away, um, stiff and and i say he was stiff because he, he was knocked out kind of stiffened up but i talked to him afterwards he he hung around he wasn't he wasn't injured to the point of going to the hospital or anything like that and so it's a it's a good thing that he was already kind of looking and feeling better by the time i talked to him afterwards but for for you though i know there's that kind of that pride thing that you don't want to get taken down because ideally you want to dominate every minute of every round but I think you also recognize because you you were two and two pro coming into this fight. You recognize the fact that um, sort of generalship, you know, being a general, being a little bit more aware, and, and and he's got a lot of fight IQ too. You've got a lot of fight mm -hmm. IQ, but kind of picking your battles and figuring out the fact that there, there's a lot of little moments in a pro fifteen minute fight. Of course, you didn't need all that time. But there's a lot of little moments, and I've seen some fighters understandably they get frustrated and then reckless because of like 30 seconds that they let play in their head, whether that be a takedown, whether that be, you know, some other type of thing they didn't want to have happen. Um, so for you, let's get back to what this means to you for your career. Cause you had mentioned that one of the main reasons to come in to enemy territory, he had sold and this is public knowledge. He, as a pro fighter has sold the most number of tickets ever for an in live audience comma the death star worthy it was cage side i don't know if you know who he is but he is a ufc fighter and a former 247 uh, 155 pound champ he was cage side and he previously had the record so you were coming into about 250 fans that were there for him maybe more um but overall, a 3 our record as a pro, he was 5-1 and one as an amateur, only lost the split decision, and trains out of a huge gym, uh, Randy Couture's gym, Extreme Couture. So where does this put you, and have you heard from either promoters or managers to kind of uh, bump your, your status since you're 3-2, and two, but this big win is your signature win so far, with maybe the head kick being a good, uh, obviously a good, as well, you're two in a row now with big knockouts. Yeah, um, you know, we're kind of looking at what's the next step for us. Um, Coach Rob handles a lot of that. So we're kind of seeing what's the next best steps for me, you know, looking at the, you know, whether it's a, a bigger 
promotion that, you know, maybe I get a few fights with that can then lead me into somewhere like the UFC. So that's obviously, that's, that's the ultimate goal. Um, so yeah, we, we don't know for sure. I'd like to fight probably around early August, late July. I want to take a little bit of time to, uh, just get in the gym and train and develop. Cause recently I've, it's been either fight camps or injuries, you know, right after my last fight, I wanted to fight right away. Woke up in the middle of the night, could barely move my knee, had a knee infection, out six weeks. Came back for about two weeks, three weeks. I think probably my IT band, something. I was on a shot, heard a snap, crackle, pop, didn't hurt. Next day, I can feel it. So that, you know, puts me out a few weeks late. Come back, hurt my ribs a few weeks late. So it's like I've had injury after injury to, uh, you know, have to deal with where it was never anything major, but it would always – stop me from being in the gym full force. So I want to take the next few weeks to really develop and, you know, work on some of the things I want before going right back into a, a fight camp for, you know, July or August. I mean, I'm obviously excited to get in there and I'd like to fight all the time, but these, uh, these next, you know, five, six weeks will take as a developmental time. I'm not going anywhere. I'm still going to be in the gym six days a week. Um, and then getting right back to it, you know, July or August, hopefully for, uh, a promotion that can help me, you know, get to the top. Sure. And I know you train at Bauerhaus MMA. Um, that's actually how I heard of you because I had Anthony Hogebeck on the show and he was high on you because you guys train together at Bauerhaus. And uh, on the on the fight list day of, they also had you listed as, and I might be mispronouncing it, Roma Academy. Um, what? Yeah. I, pro, okay. So talk a little bit about those two gyms and, and sort of what you train at those gyms and kind of some of the, some of the behind the scenes as far as developing your skill set. Yeah. So Ryoma is who I originally started MMA with. Um, and that's who I'm still primarily with. They are about two minutes from me. You know, I can, I can run there on days if I want. Um, so that's where I was usually mainly out of, and that's still where I'm going to be a little more often than not. Um, you know, that's Brent Walter and Bob Carter that own that. Brent's been my MMA coach. He's also one of my best friends. Uh, you know, he's been a big part in my development. Uh, so, you know, I do do everything there as I would at Bauerhaus. I'm doing my my kickboxing and my my grappling and jujitsu. When I go down Bauerhaus, um, it is more MMA oriented, but I do get a lot of good jujitsu looks down there. Uh, Chris Bauer always has amazing athletes coming through world class all the time and then i have coach rob mccraw down there so he's who works with a lot of my strict mma game you know working a lot more just strict mma and i have a lot of partners down there my size that's the thing for for the first part of my career i was sparring with brent who was a 170 155 pounder and my buddy logan die who was a 205 185 pounder and even before that when i was boxing my main my main boxing partner was my coach who was a, a pro 155er you know so i've always had these bigger guys and um getting to bauer house i had guys like terry bartholomew to work with who was a pro 35er has amazing wrestling and grappling really helped my game uh you know improve by leaps and bounds and i also have mark google mini who we were old we would wrestle with each other in the off season back in high school and uh, now we're MMA teammates. He's having his second pro fight coming up. He's another 25 pounder on the rise. Um, you know, just a lot of guys down there at Bauerhaus for me to work for um, or work with. But they live, they live. I live about an hour, 35, hour 40 from there. So I take the trip down with uh, Chase Thomas, Noah Kiska, a lot, two amateurs. And I train from about 7.30 to 10 or so. You know, by the time I we stop, get gas, eat, I usually get home around twelve thirty. Uh, you know, some days I'm going to work and at six o'clock the next morning, we're waking up at six morning to go work still. So, yeah. Well, that's that's obviously the life of <laughs> of all amateur fighters and like yourself now. Even though you're establishing yourself as a pro, you're not at that point where you don't need a full time job. So there's obviously a lot to balance. Um, it's exciting. To, to have been able to be cage side and see such a huge fight. I mean, the 247 card, for people that didn't get a chance to see it, you can get the subscription on 247 Live for the great app that they have and get access to the entire catalog. But that 
throwing the bird 16. There were 16 fights, maybe because it was 16. No, just kidding. But there were 16 fights, three pro fights. You guys could have been a headliner. The co-main event could have been a headliner. And obviously the main event was a headliner. So it was just so deep. Uh, you don't get a lot of uh, of regional cards. I think that's what makes 247 so exciting. They're, they're putting on quality uh, fights all the way through. It's actually going to be on local Pittsburgh, a local Pittsburgh TV station. Y your fans won't be able to get it, but it it's yeah. going to have a replay in, in the Pittsburgh uh, listening and viewing audience uh, this coming Saturday, a few days from now. Obviously, your fight will be featured because – He's the hometown guy. You came in and played spoilers. So you're going to get a lot of eyes from the from the Pittsburgh fans. They might not love you, but you're still going to get a lot of eyes. So it really is it really is exciting. You're you're a fun guy. I'd love to continue to follow, and that's what's kind of fun. Regional MMA isn't always able to hold on to every fighter who's ever fought for the promotion. They're not as big as the UFC that has hundreds of fighters in their roster. So a lot of times, two four seven, I get the opportunity to interview somebody, watch them fight live and then kind of they move on and they go to, you know, they do something else. So I'd love to continue to follow you on MMA FanCast. Thanks so much for coming on the show and giving a breakdown of at least right now, it's a knockout of the year contender. 247 does do, if you're not aware of this, uh, January 5th of this year, we did the first annual 247 award show, uh, which has all the categories you'd expect, fight of the year, knockout of the year, pro fight of the year, amateur fight of the year, gym of the year coaches of the year and as of right now i definitely expect your knockout of him to be in the running we'll see come next year you know a year from now ish um what, what kind of what shakes out but thanks so much for coming on the show said yeah it's uh it's a great fight for them it was great having victor as uh, an opponent i i ran into his fans literally everywhere that i went that night the chef at the casino knew me i mean and the thing is you know it's you know, you're always a little back and forth leading up to a fight, but you know, me and Victor spoke for, you know, a, a long time afterwards. Him and his team were a class act, super nice guys. Um, his fans, I ran into them at Sheets, ran into them at the casino, everywhere. They all come up, shake my hand. They were all super cool afterwards. So it was a real fun time fighting for 247, and it was you know great to be in the cage with Lapari. Well, I, I think you, both of you are class acts. You said something on the mic. Uh, the, the crowd was so loud, not everybody heard it in the audience, but uh, I, I think on the broadcast, it probably came across a little clearer. But you said something that, that I think is really meaningful, and that is every fighter deserves a fan base that, that's that's a fan of theirs, that's exciting. And obviously, Victor has a great fan base. He said something like, you're, you're happy that you saw so many Victor fans because he deserves a great fan base. Every fighter deserves a fa great fan base. Not all fighters, unfortunately, get a good fan base. Uh, sometimes they have to, um, they have to kind of have a big knockout or something like that to get them. But th that's a great attitude to have, as opposed to being sort of upset that he had so many fans. It's a good thing that any fighter, particularly early in a pro career, um, would, would have so many fans because that's what gets, that's what keeps MMA moving. You know, MMA is a sport that that functions because fans go to see it. Without that, it wouldn't really be an, a, like as big as it is. So. You're a class act. Can't wait to continue to follow uh, your career. Congratulations to you and to your team. And really the mindset to be able to find an opening in a fight. We had talked about on the show uh, on, that you could have come out with the mindset of, oh, I got to stay away from him. I, I, you know, circle, circle. And then, and then that opportunity not come open. Uh, but you looked for what, for what worked for you. So uh, a huge congratulations to you and to your team. And thanks so much for coming on the show. Cody, mad cat. Matthews, thanks so much, buddy. Luke. You got it, bud.